I'd like to enter. We'll start again. I'd like to introduce Rabbi Stephen Engel. Uh, Rabbi Engel is a rabbi of the Central Florida's largest Reformed Jewish congregation. Outside of CRJ, he presently serves on the board of New Hope for Kids Grieving Center for Children of Maitland, and he's a founding member of the Interfaith Council of Central Florida. He's involved in a program repairing bicycles for the homeless and has served as an adjunct professor of religion and a guest lecturer at Rollins College and the University of Central Florida. Robin Engel received his BA in physics from Rutgers University and a master's degree from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. He received his rabbinic ordination in 1988 and a doctorate in divinity in 2013 from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati. I'd like you all to join us in welcome Robin Engel. Let's speak. First applause with the last applause. Mm -hmm. Let's see how I do. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for uh, taking the time. I really respect you as teachers, taking the time to learn from different people and hopefully to bring some good information back to your students to, to make a difference for them who are going to be the next generation to make a difference in the world. You do the most important thing. In my tradition, Judaism teachers are the most on the highest level of people in their profession. So I, as a rabbi, consider myself a teacher, so it's nice to be amongst fellow teachers. I'm gonna be speaking about today a subject that's easy to cover in an hour. I'm gonna be speaking about anti-Semitism. That was the general idea, but also how do you teach kids anti-Semitism? What do you say about it? And before I get into really the body of the material, because I want to share with you a history of anti-Semitism, a brief, albeit a brief history of anti-Semitism, re recognizing that anti-Semitism wasn't created by Adolf Hitler during World War II, but anti-Semitism has a long history that in fact goes all the way back to biblical times. I'm not gonna go all the way back then and spend a lot of time, it would take us days. But um, also that anti-Semitism also to be compared to other isms and, uh, and phobias. So as I talk about anti-Semitism, we could extrapolate a lot of the comments they're going to speak today about racism, sexism, Islamophobia, homophobia, that some of the principles that I'm going to talk about today can be extrapolated to all these different types of prejudices or hatred. So I don't want you to see, on the one hand, that anti-Semitism is unique in particular. It is in some ways, which I'm going to discuss, but also there are universal aspects of it. You know, this morning, uh, one of the things I want to mention before I talk about the history is something that I think is critically important when you teach any of this to your students. I'm reminded by that by this morning as I was listening to National Public Radio, I heard one of our um, Congress people who will go unnamed because I don't want to give him any credit, but he made a statement today that uh, taking away guns, we're having a debate in our country, right? Taking away guns from American citizens <coughs> is exactly, will lead to the same results that Adolf Hitler in taking guns away from Jews. Well. First of all, that's not true. There's no factual evidence there's any kind of campaign. But the implication is that you can use anti-Semitism in the Holocaust to be compared to anything to make a point, right? So his point was, if you take away guns from Americans, they're going to end up in concentration camps or abused or murdered like the Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. That's offensive on many levels to me as a Jew, but I want to I want to talk about why really when the crux of all of these Holocaust things that are being thrown around, all this anti-Semitism, all this racism comments that everyone feels free to compare all those events to any point they want to make, they'll use the Holocaust, they'll use racism, they'll use slavery, and why that's wrong. Well, the truth is about any kind of history that it's not monolithic. It has multi-layers. And particularly when we talk about anti-Semitism and racism and sexism, that those things have really two different aspects, which I think makes it offensive to those who are affected, whether you're African-American or Black in terms of racism, when, whether you're Jewish in terms of anti-Semitism, or you're a female in terms of sexism. And that is, there's for all of these things, there's a particularistic aspect of it, and there's a universal aspect of it. And so when we teach these things, we need to teach both. In terms of anti-Semitism, for instance, there's a very particularistic aspect of anti-Semitism, that is those who are affected by anti-Semitism, namely Jews, right? 
We're taught growing up as Jews, our kids are taught very specifically either through our religious education or what I call cultural osmosis or genetic tendency. We absorb ideas that there were 6 million Jews killed, a million and a half children. Our children have a sense of either they experience anti-Semitism personally or they know their parents have or grandparents have. So there's a particularistic aspect to anti-Semitism that specifically affects Jews. And yet there's a universal aspect to anti-Semitism too. Because the truth is that the same kind of anti-Semitism that is perpetuated wherever it is, is has the same basis, has the same ideology, has the, and that's why groups like white supremacists, they don't only attack Jews. They attack Jews and Blacks and those who are different, and even women to a certain extent, because there is a universal nature to anti-Semitism as too. We learn about anti-Semitism, we can learn about those other isms and phobias at the same time. And living in a democratic country, it, it minimizes who we are as Americans and our freedoms and our constitution if we do not teach anti-Semitism on the one hand as particularistic toward Jews and then more universalistic toward others. And this is, there's an interesting aspect of this which is related to the Holocaust. And that is even in the terminology. I don't know if during yesterday that you heard the term Holocaust and you heard, heard the term Shoah. Have you heard those two terms used? Shoah is a Hebrew word. Holocaust comes from a Greek word. Right, the Greek word, and I'm going to have to because my Greek is not perfect here. Holocaustum. And that Greek word actually comes from a Hebrew translation of a word named, a word meaning Ola. Ola was the animal sacrifice that the Jews would do in the ancient temple. They would take an animal, they would put it on an altar, and they would burn it. And the smoke would rise up and it would be a pleasing odor to God. So this word Holocaust comes from the Greek that comes from the Hebrew that means a burnt sacrifice. And when we use this term Holocaust, I think most of the time we use it in a more, hopefully, when you use the term Holocaust, use it in a more universalistic aspect. That it's not only about the 6 million Jews, but also about the 6 million non-Jews, those who were political dissidents, those who were homosexuals, those who were who were Roma, right? Those in, um, those who were um, Jehovah's Witness, all of the other people who died. So the Holocaust is, yes, a universalistic event. That's why you teach it. You don't just teach it because it's about Jews. You teach it because it's about humanity. And the idea that other, I don't, was Mark Witten already here? Did you have Mark Witten as a scholar? You will. He's a great scholar. He talks about genocide. So there are, there are genocides that have happened all over the world. So in a way, the Holocaust is part of a history of genocide in a universalistic aspect, but it's also particularistic. The word Shoah, some of you have heard the word Shoah? Okay. The word Shoah, on the other hand, is not really used as much as in the universalistic sense, I think, but it's used mostly amongst Jews. We Jews call it the Shoah sometimes, and particularly in Israel, it's Hebrew, but also because of the unique nature of this event in Jewish history. Shoah comes from biblical verses, which mean total consumption or a catastrophe of something. It's used in the book of Isaiah several times. It means a catastrophe. So for the general world, it has this sense of the burned sacrifice, the crematoria that were used by the Germans. In a particularistic sense, by using the word Shoah, it reflects directly about the Jews, the six million Jews and three and a half children who suffered during the Holocaust. My point of this is when we talk about anti-Semitism or sexism or racism, we need to look in the universal nature of these events, but we cannot minimize the particularistic aspect of these events. Okay, so I'm gonna stop for a minute because I'm gonna go on to some history about anti-Semitism, but I just wanna know if you have any questions, comments about this aspect of teaching 
whatever ism or ever phobia that you happen to be teaching. Yeah, I, yes. I, I've got one. Sure. I, I, I've always seen my limited view of, of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust being two totally separate things. But the way that I'm hearing you, it, they're, they're very much intermingled. Is that right? Well, I would say, well, I want to answer that in two ways. You can't obviously look at the Holocaust. I'm not talking about World War II. I'm talking about the Holocaust aside from anti-Semitism. It's what drove the Holocaust. One aspect, not every aspect, the main aspect, right? Hitler didn't create anti-Semitism. He merely built upon what was already used and he took it in a different way and he packaged it for the circumstances that the German people were experiencing. So that's why it's, it's racism just didn't happen in America instantly. It had a long history. All of these things have long histories that must be understood. But unless, if we don't, we minimize the context of anti-Semitism in the Holocaust. Okay. On the other hand, again, it has a long history. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that, that helped. I just okay. I want to make sure I was hearing you hearing you correct. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that whenever we teach these have to teach the long historical aspects that lead up to these events. You know, lynchings in America just didn't have, you're talking about lynchings, just didn't happen out of the air. It had a long history in America and in other parts of the world that led to events of slavery in America, right? It's, Ameri it's uniquely American, but it has a universal aspect as well. Any other questions or comments? I think it's so important that it's hard because sometimes in the Jewish community, we only teach it as a uniquely Jewish. Sometimes in the public school, we teach it as a universal event. But I think in order to be true to the, what it is, we need to teach both aspects of it. How you do that, that's a question of how we're able to accomplish both. Sort of like if you want to teach slavery, you're not going to teach it just as a world event. You need to be sensitive to those who have experienced it Blacks who have experienced it both outside America and inside America. Okay, so let me let me take. I'm going to have questions at the end as well. Let me take you through what I consider a very brief history of anti-Semitism, its beginnings, its roots, and some of the major points, the touch points along the way, and then ending on what are some of the common myths about Jews that are considered anti-Semitic tropes. Where do they come from? And again, the things that we hear in the Holocaust, those things aren't new. Those things are century, if not millennia old. Okay, so although um, anti-Semitism can be traced back really from the first text that we have, for instance, to Egyptian texts, we even find in some Egyptian texts, which is interesting because the major story in Jewish tradition is about the freedom from Egypt. From the Jewish perspective, it's considered the seminal event in Jewish history of the Jews freeing from slavery from Egypt and becoming free people. But yet, when we trace Egyptian history all the way back, even back in Egyptian history, there are incidents of pointing out Jews as other, as different, as following a wrong God, as following a jealous God. And there are many texts that I could bring in, but unless you read ancient Egyptian, it probably would not talk to you very much. But today, but as we talk about it, the word anti-Semitism can really be traced back to the end of the 19th century. And it's a modern invention that emerged in the wake of a European nationalism that was coming to its, its core in the late 1860s and 1870s by a German uh, uh, journalist, which Mitch knows very well, right? Wilhelm Marr. In 1879, Wilhelm Marr starts a, um, what's called, what he calls the League of Anti-Semites. And he coins the term anti-Semites and anti-Semitism in 1879. Today, he's sometimes called the father, um, and I'm not a title that I would want to have, the father of anti-Semitism. Not only inventing for the name, but for also defining what it meant. It's not just a matter of Jewish ancestry or faith or culture, but it's also become the idea that the idea of Jews not being 
being able to be your friend, your neighbor, not able to be your citizen, and taking it all the way down the line to being actually dehumanized. And we know what happens when people dehumanize others. He is the first to talk about, given the circumstances they lived around, of the Jew being the foil, the scapegoat, which would be used, as we know, later on by Adolf Hitler and others. But as I said, long before Marr coined the term anti-Semitism, there were instances of Jews being excluded from society as being seen as the other. And really, I trace anti-Semitism um, in, in a real extent back to the Gr Greek and Roman Empire. In the year 70, the ancient temple that stood in Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. The Romans were very, very angry at the Jewish priests and the Jewish leaders and the Jewish revolutionaries. This, of course, is the same period of which two great traditions emerge. There were a hundred and something revolutionary groups during that time that were fighting against the Romans at the temple who didn't want the Romans there. But out of that, out of that uh, cataclysm of that revolution, when the Romans destroyed the temple, and that plants the seeds in a real way for what would happen 400, 300 something years later, when Judaism becomes the, when Judaism, when Christianity becomes the official religion of Rome under Constantine and later, later Roman emperor. But needless to say, the Romans are upset with the Jews around the year 70. The two great traditions that emerge after the destruction of the temple are what? What, what, what religions emerge from the destruction of the ancient temple in the year 70? Christianity. Christianity. And the other is what we call rabbinic Judaism. Not Judaism, but a specific kind of Judaism. They are the two survivors from all of that revolution. And so what we have is we already have two things pitted against each other. We have early Christianity and rabbinic Judaism or Judaism naturally pitted against each other under the Roman rule. And for the next 300 years or so, that conflict continues to boil and continues to brew from the beginning of the destruction of the temple. In the, the Roman Empire, before that time, during that time, the Roman Empire permits Judaism. However, however, there is the beginnings of a jealousy. There's the beginnings of a distinction between one faith and another faith. There's a distinction about values. And there's certainly a distinction of rejection of rituals and traditions. This is also a history of religion that Christianity rejects circumcision and rejects several other Jewish beliefs, basic Jewish beliefs, belief of a covenant. So you can see how the tension is already created between the Jewish community and the Christian community. In the years following Jesus' death, the early Christian writings, certainly, for instance, the writings of Paul the Apostle, do support negative caricatures of Jews, heartless, outdated, focused on strict laws, the barbarism of circumcision, etc. You can find these in the early gospels and the early writings of Christianity. Jews were backwards, or at the least, and at the worst, Jews were wrong of the rejection of Jesus as Messiah. While the Romans had sentenced and crucified Jesus, Christians could not openly criticize Rome for fear of retribution. So who could they blame for the crucifixion of Christ? although there's no historical evidence for this, the Jews. The Jews were responsible for crucifying God, and the implication of that is obvious. The Gospels envision the temple leadership, unpopular amongst Christian fathers, to be those who killed Christ, and thus Jews were demonized from the beginning. So for millennia, there are writers and, and Christian leaders and the church itself that refers to Jews as Christ killers. Even today, there are places in the world where this notion still exists. But the big event happens in 391 when Christianity becomes the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire. It's interesting at that time, by the way, that Jews converted people. A lot of people think that Jews don't go out and convert people. Jews went out and converted people until the year 391 when Christianity became the official religion of Rome. 
At that point, it wasn't too popular or too smart to, for Jews to go out and try to convert, convert Christians back to Judaism. And so conversions stops, and it's a real sign of what was happening historically during that time. During that time, also attacks as the Roman Empire, Christianity became the official religion of a governmental, and listen to what I'm saying, when a religion or an ideology becomes part of a governmental policy, that's oftentimes throughout history when things go wrong. And so when Christianity becomes the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire, this is when increased attacks on synagogues and Jews that happens and continues to happen officially, poli official policy of the Roman government through the fourth and fifth centuries of Roman rule. Christian leaders supported laws to restrict the, uh, the freedom of Jews. Across the Holy Roman Empire, Jews officially became second-class citizens. They were not allowed to marry Christians. They were not allowed to employ Christians. They were not allowed to witness against Christians in court. Anti-Jewish hostility became the cultural norm. Jews were blind to the truths of the empire's privileged religion. In some regions, Jews were later forbidden from owning land or holding positions in government. For centuries, a vicious cycle which transpired. Official discrimination against Jews appeared to be justified by the common anti-Jewish bigotry and superstition that such discrimination actually involved. This was a precursor to Germany's governmental anti-Semitism that would happen thousands of years later. But further west, the situation was that some Jews were prospering and experienced, but at the same time experiencing severe discrimination. This was in the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth centuries. Jews were barred from professional guilds in Western and Central Europe. In medieval Europe, Jews were, uh, were, were not permitted to engage in most trade unions. And the only thing that was left for Jews to do was to be financial people, to actually be involved in high interest crediting because the church had designated the application of interest-based loans as a sin for Christians. Christians could not give loan money to people under using interest. But since Jews weren't Christians, they were allowed to do it. And so nobility turned to Jews as the ones who would be involved in money lending. And of course, this led, as we'll see, to many anti-Semitic tropes and ideas of Jews as controlling the world. And so Jews became financiers and tax collectors. Jews often served as middle people between the nobility and the peasant class. In time, the application of interest itself became a derogatory trope, with Jews commonly stereotyped as cheap, greedy, exploitative, good with money. Medieval rules come, came to equate Jews with financial skills, sometimes even setting up separate sections in their kingdoms for Jews to live protected so Jews could be the money lenders. They could be the tax collectors. They could be the bankers. These roles, obviously, if you're a peasant, do you like the person who's your banker, who's collecting money from you? Are you happy with them? Of course you're not. This only led to greater hatred by the peasantry against Jews, which will happen later on, as we'll see. And as the financial economies began to expand, the role of the Jew as finance lender and banker continued to expand. Several medieval popes strove to protect Jews' physical safety, declared that Jews were meant to be kept alive in the state of misery as a living testament to the truth that Christianity was triumphant over Judaism. Medieval Christians revived the idea as Jews as demonic Christ killers, and even imagined horns and tails on their bodies. In medieval, under medieval superstition, of course, Michelangelo, who created a famous statue of Moses with horns, who took a mistranslation from the Hebrew, by the way, and that be continued on. The Hebrew word for horn is the same Hebrew word for Karen. I mean, excuse me, for halo. The word Karen means horn and means halo, the same Hebrew word. And when Michelangelo 
consulted a person who did know Hebrew and probably looked in a Hebrew dictionary, I imagine, and said, oh, Moses had horns. When in fact, in the Torah, it says Moses came down from the mountain and a halo appeared over his head. And so Michelangelo created a Moses statue. Some of you may have seen it, a famous statue with horns, a complete mistranslation of it. Also, during the medieval period, which was a period of superstition, rumors also spread that Jewish Jews needed Christian blood for use in the Passover ritual. When a Christian child went missing, Jews were repeatedly accused of having kidnapped the missing child and used their blood to make matzah and to use for the Passover ritual. This was known as the blood libel. This was in medieval Europe and would continue on. This Accusation spurred the unjust torturing, pillaging, and killing and expulsion of countless European Jews. By the 13th century, gets better, the church required Jews in some contexts to wear special hats or badges. Hats or badges, the church in the 13th century. Again, Hitler didn't invent this. He merely reinterpreted it. Jews were suspected of poisoning wells. Despite the protective efforts of Pope Clement VI and other Christian rulers, tens of thousands of Jews were burned alive under, um, under these circumstances. Jews causing plagues, the bubonic plague that spread throughout Europe. Jews were accused of causing the bubonic plague and were burned to death. By the 16th century, the Italian peninsula and some German speaking towns forcibly segregated Jewish within specific parts of town. The areas would become known in Italian, translated as Italian, as ghettos. In the, in the early as the 16th century, Jews were separated into ghettos. The Catholic Church led the way with anti-Judaism practices, but it's not only the Catholic Church. Luther, Martin Luther, spearheaded a new vision of the Christian faith, Protestantism as we know. But he also advanced in a strong way anti-Semitic beliefs of the past in order to try to force Jews to convert to his new brand of Christianity. In his later writings, Luther lobbied for the burning of synagogues and destruction of Jewish homes, for the confiscation of Jewish books, for the restrictions on Jewish freedom of travel, and for the expulsion of Jews from Saxony and other German-specific territories. His followers held anti-Semitic riots and looted synagogues, and Jews were expelled from several Lutheran states in the 1580s. Luther's treatises against the Jews would be reprinted centuries later. Most of the anti-Semitic books later published in that Nazi Germany would often quote Luther's words of the condemnation of Jews. Since the 13th century, Jews had been repeatedly subjected to forced conversions, expropriations, and massacres in Central and Western Europe. They were continually also expelled when the ruler had enough and couldn't use the Jewish bankers and money lenders at the, because of the uprising of people. Jews would be expelled from the countries. 1290 from England, 1394 from France, and as we know very well, during the Spanish Inquisition from 1492 in Spain. By the end of the Middle Ages, anti-Jewish violence and expulsion virtually had eradicated all Jewish communities from Western Europe. And so where were Jews forced to move? They were forced to go, they were forced to go east into Russian-held territories and Eastern European provinces. In fact, more Jews would be expelled from Europe and Arab countries between 1865 and 1965 than had previously been recorded in all of the past history. This played out in the public stage on 1894 when forged documents were used to accuse a court-martialed French lieutenant. And this was a seminal event of anti-Semitism. Jews had believed since the beginning of the 19th century that with enlightenment, the idea that people were gonna be enlightened culture, music, advances in science, that this would lead to an opening up of ideas of accepting Jews into a society. And to a certain extent, it did. But in 1894, a French lieutenant 
colonel named Alfred Dreyfus was accused falsely of being treasonous in the French army. This became an international event. Despite proof of forgery, efforts to bring justice to Dreyfus could not be carried out. And Dreyfus would not be released and admitted to the army in 1906. The Jewish idea that we would finally be accepted and anti-Semitism would go away would be ended. And by the way, just as an aside, one man who visited Dreyfus when he was imprisoned in Devil's Island was a man named Theodor Herzl, who was a secular Jew, who realized that if Alfred Dreyfus, who is the highest levels of French society, would be accused of anti-Semitism, that Jews would never be fully accepted in Europe. And he had an idea to resettle Jews in their own homeland. He is the father of modern Zionism, Theodor Herzl. He wrote a book called The Jewish State. And interestingly enough, there were suggestions of where this would be. Some suggested, obviously, in Palestine, where Israel ended up, but some suggested Uganda, and also an island off of Argentina. We could have Jews, we could have ended up in Uganda. Us in, and us in Idi Amin, that would be great. And I want to, I want to finish because I want to return now to Mark because we're around that time now. He was amongst the most prominent voices to racialize what he would call, in the beginning, the Jewish question. The Jewish or the, the Jewish question and the final solution to the Jewish question. During this time, speaking to the dangerous social Darwinist notions, the notion that, and this was also applied as Mitch, what he was speaking about to black people as well, that there were certain inbred traits which cannot, they were just, Jews were made a certain way as blacks were, and this is just proven genetically and nothing, their inferiority and nothing could be done about it. He condemned Jews as the enemies of the state, not merely a different religion, but even in the eight, late 1800s, Marr blamed Jews to be an alien race. He blamed the Jewish humanist ideas as well as the forces of urbanization and ultimately the economic woes that Germans would are, were experiencing and would experience through the end of World War I and into World War II. Many Jews reside at this time of having found security in the context of shifting borders. In 1881, under, under uh, let me go back for a second. Um, Jews moved to Eastern Europe, but it wasn't safe there as well. Jews were targeted for violence during moments of upheaval. What was happening in Tsarist Russia? There was a, a war, right, between different factions of Russian society, and Jews were caught in the middle. This is the beginning of, during Mars time, not coincidentally, the idea of pogroms. In 1881, Jewish property was destroyed in a wave of over 250 pogroms. These were raiding of small Jewish villages, oftentimes destroying the villages and killing the Jews who were there. During the 1905 to 1907 revolution of Russia, Russian loyalists targeted Jews, killing hundreds of them, specifically in places today that we know, and history comes around. Some of those, the worst killings were in Odessa and Kiev. And during the same time, there was one other thing to say. During the same time of anti-Jewish violence in Eastern Europe, there is a forged pamphlet entitled The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, believed to be created by Russian secret police in Paris in the late 1890s. The track supposedly revealed the minutes from a secret meeting of Jewish elders who were plotting world domination through the control of politics and the economy around the world. Liberalism, Marxism, anarchism, parliamentary democracy, they were all plots of Jews. And it gave a boost to the already anti-Semitic beliefs of the past. Additionally, in the 1917 Russian Revolution and Germany's defeat in World War I had the special power to go back to the protocols as a desperate, desperate reactionist uh, view to prove Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy to overthrow Russia. So once again, Jews were not part of it. 
I'm going to end there because I want to talk just a few minutes about the history, but also based on this history, some of the a few of the anti-Semitic myths, not only Hitler used, but white supremacists continue to use today directly from the history of anti-Semitism. The thing about Jewish that anti-Semitic myths that are so interesting, that are so peculiar, is they're very contradictory, the anti-Semitic myths. They're, and one on the one hand, Jews want to control the world. On the other hand, they're too different from everyone else. The contradictory logic that envisioned Jews is both excessively powerful, controlling the world, but is weak, feeble people. A couple of the myths that exist because of history are, Jews have too much power. Jews account for approximately 0.2% of the world population. Yet anti-Semites believe that this tiny minority is not only on a quest for total world domination, but is already in control of the banks and media, industry, government, and even the weather. Did you know that Jews control the weather? If you want it to snow tomorrow, just tell me I'll arrange it. <laughs> Jews are disloyal. Anti-Semites anti frequently suspect Jews of holding allegiance only to fellow Jews and to a uniquely Jewish agenda. And by the way, the, the Jewish connection to Israel is used for this same anti-Semitic trope to say that Jews aren't loyal Americans, they're only loyal to Israel. Jews had a uniquely Jewish agenda where untrustworthy neighbors and citizens loyal. We can't be trusted. Also, Jews are greedy. One of the most prominent persistent stereotypes of Jews is that we hope to make ourselves rich by any means. We are seen both as relentless in the pursuit of wealth and also as stingy misers at the same time, determined not to let any money slip away from our grasp. Jews killed Jesus. The myth that Jews collectively murdered Jesus, also referred to as deicide, has been used to justify violence against Jews for centuries. Historians agree, as well as Christian leaders, that this claim is baseless based on historical events. And I'm going to end there. And I just I want to open it up for questions, discussions for you to ask me personally, uh, to ask me about anti-Semitism, the history. You can see just to end how these myths that were eventually used by Hitler and even are used by white supremacists today, they were not created recently. These have long histories that go back millennia, back to the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire and its embracing of Christianity. I always think, wow, what would it have been like if, uh, if Judaism was the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire? I don't know, maybe there would have been corruption amongst Jewish uh, leaders as well. But whenever we mix government, it's for another discussion. Whenever we mix government and religion, it's a recipe for things going bad and going wrong. Yes. Yeah, I was just curious, since the creation of the state of Israel, did, um, did anti-Semitism change at all? Did it increase? Like, when people were once uh, the issue with Jewish people in general, opposed to the government of Israel? Um, I don't know about statistics of anti-Semitism increasing based on Israel becoming a country. I don't think that that mattered for most people who already uh, extorted anti-Semitism. But I do know that the issue of as a separate entity, as a country, has is a is has caused anti-Semitic tropes. It's added to the list of myths that Jews are disloyal and they're more loyal to Israel than not. And so, you know, the the state of Israel as a country, I just so you know that I think for most Jewish people, I I'm American, but I have a connection to Israel as a place perhaps in the same way that maybe an Italian person would have a connection to Italy or an Irish person would have a connection to Ireland in a, in a religious sense as well, because it is called the Jewish state. But for me, I have two connections to Israel. One is as a spiritual religious home that I never give up on. And it's unequivocal in terms of Israel as a political entity. I can argue with Israel. I can disagree with its government policy. And that's what a lot of people don't understand about it. I, and that doesn't mean that I don't care about the country. I, I as American, criticize America. You criticize America. Does that mean you don't, you don't still love the country? 
So there's not, what it's been used for, it's been used as a new kind of anti-Semitism. And by the way, from the right and from the left, from both ends of the political spe spectrum, by the right and the left to go after Israel. And one thing I wanna say that I did mention is that we have to be careful when we talk about anti-Semitism, and this is really important. Thank you for raising that question about Israel. There's a difference between, and I think Mitch touched on this a little bit, the difference between ignorance and anti-Semitism, sometimes a fine line. When someone says to me, and I've heard people say it when I'm in a social, don't, right? Anti-Semitic, I have to know the source, but probably not. It's that someone said something and they're not, it's not a deep hatred against Jews or against Judaism or against the faith, but it's ignorance. So some of the stuff about Israel is ignorance. And I don't want to label because oftentimes whenever anybody says one criticizes Israel, you're anti-Semitic. That that should not be a I criticize Israel. Am I anti-Semitic? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not. So we have to be careful about the line between what is anti-Semitism and ignorance. What's the difference between racism and ignorance, sexism and ignorance, right? There's sometimes a line that you get close to. We have to make a distinction between that and not call out everything as anti -Semitic. Is that? Yes. Okay, if I don't answer your question, I can just admit, yeah, yes. How are we supposed to combat anti-Semitism in our classroom when there are teachers on our team who believe the same anti-Semitic terms? Well, how are we supposed to combat it? I think by teaching that those things are not true, I think by teaching a history so that people understand that this is a history that is and, and where it came from and how it was promoted. You know, popes, popes in recent memory have come forward and made repentance for the things that the Catholic Church has done, for instance, and said it was wrong, the things that the Catholic Church said about Jews. So sometimes it's reflecting someone about their own faith or their faith leader. You know, and, and even Protestant denominations have come forward and said the things that were said against Jews were simply wrong. They were said and they were wrong because we asked for forgiveness for those and we retract those. I think in teaching people how to think, teaching your students how to think intelligently and rationally, understanding history, and teaching that anti-Semitism is another form if they can understand racism or sexism and understand that the, the myths of those isms and phobias, that I think that it goes a long way in helping. But I, I always tell kids, be careful that it's not ignorance because we have to approach ignorance than we do for anti-Semitism. But there are things that have happened in schools where the, sometimes the Jewish kid comes forward, sometimes the non-Jewish. You know, it do, I don't have to be black to call out racism. I don't have to be Jewish to call it anti-Semitism. And sometimes it's a matter of reminding someone and they say, oh yeah, I didn't mean to say that or I didn't realize that's wrong. So I think it's a matter of education. I don't know, Mitch, you're, you work in the schools and you've done this a long time, so. I don't know if you know that. Well, I, think, um, I think you're right. You know, um, in fact, oftentimes it's more important for the person who is not in the group that's been insulted to call out mm -hmm. the tropes. Yeah. Uh, if somebody in the group. I mean, I've heard awful yeah. things. Our kids, have, you know, kids on the bus that say, you know, your grandfather should have been, your grandfather should have been burned in an oven or, you know, terrible stuff that kids say, but where do they get it from? Well, right. That was kind of my point is that we hear what kids say, but then also sometimes faculty as well. I, I think people need to address it, not be get, a, get away with what they say and be challenged with what they say. And why do you say that? Why do you think that's a fact? Why do you think, you know, there are many churches that, not many, there are some churches that still teach, you know, Jews killed Jesus. When a little kid hears Jews killed Jesus, what's that kid going to do with it? How, how uncomfortable are you going to get? Yeah, because that's just like the story I told. You might be called out, but if it's in the middle of a staff meeting, if it's in the middle of a PLC, and how uncomfortable are you willing to get with another educator who says something that's out of turn? And I think of this like this someone who's making it and you're determining you know the person, the comment they're making, is it anti Semitic? Is it a black, is it a lack of education? Is it ignorance? Mm -hmm. And just like the issue where I mentioned about the teacher who 
made the joke that they thought was, that they thought would make funny on uh, bringing students down for a tour of his kilns. You know, so uh, now he knew what he was saying. It was it was it was, and, and I waited for him to kind of backpedal or to address it after I brought it up to him. And then I said, well, we're going to have to address this. And then you can go into administration. It made things uncomfortable. But I felt like I did the right thing and what needed to be done. So it's better, you know, I'm trying to educate, but it, is the person willing to hear what you have to say? And, and, and maybe that person is willing to stand up. Just like if you heard someone in school or about another, another racial epithet or something, you, you try to educate, you try to, you know, confront, but then also try to educate that way until the point where you have to speak up and say something to administration because this person is now teaching and is responsible for educating our students and saying something to our students. And what are they going to say when they have a student in their class? Just like my student who was in Esther Lima, the young girl who was from you know Venezuela who was, uh, who was Jewish, who was, you know, kind of came to me and said, my teacher's saying these things around me and he doesn't even know that I'm Jewish. And he, you know, it makes her feel uncomfortable. And, and he's like, why well, didn't know? What does it matter if you knew or not? You don't make a comment. So, you know, how uncomfortable are you willing to get to be able to say the right thing? I think, I think, as I said in the beginning, I think that we need to teach it particularistically and universalistically. Like, would that same person say that about Black people, about women, about people from a different nationality? I mean, in a way, hatred is their hatred or prejudice or ignorance, different levels, right? But, you know, to me, it would be worse if a Jewish person said something racist or sexist because we are supposed to know what that feels like to be on the other side of that. So I'm not saying that if you're a white male American that maybe that's, I don't know. But everyone has, you know, can, can understand. I hope that that kind of either ignorance or prejudice or hatred that comes from someone. But again, I think you're right. And how comfortable you can call, how comfortable you're hearing it and how comfortable you are calling it out. But if we don't call it out, we know that during the, during the Holocaust, most people stood on the sidelines and that used to be okay. But I don't think anymore in our society or culture that, that standing on the sidelines, maybe some people feel that's a sense of, of that complacency is a sense of being responsible for. It's a big question. If you, you have to ask yourself and what do you teach your students is standing on the sideline okay? Or should you speak up? Does standing on the sideline mean a form of agreement? People used to think it was a form of neutrality, but I don't think that's culturally still true. The whole idea of bullying, when you know you see someone bully, you don't stand on the sideline because you become part of the problem. If you don't stand up, you become part of the problem because of your discomfort or your, your, uh, you know, your discomfort or you don't want to dress it, you think it's going to pass. Other questions? Yes, we feel free to ask me whatever you want to. Okay, this, this might be far-fetched, but you said um, in 1290, just sort of fell from England and mm -hmm. yeah, France, France, yeah. to Spain. Mm -hmm. And then it just hit me, you know, you just didn't think of Christopher Columbus. Mm -hmm. There's some, it's not historically accurate. People always come and say, Christopher Columbus Jewish because he yeah. was expelled. But his uh, head navigator, which I guess you can blame the guy for getting in the wrong place. He turned out okay, but uh, Louis D. Torres was his navigator and he was a Jew. There were there were Jews on Columbus's voyage because they were escaping from Spain. And by the way, the Jews that escaped from Spain eventually went to Portugal. And when they went to Portugal, they went to Brazil. And the Inquisition was still in effect by the middle of the 17th century. 1653, the first 23 Jews came to America because they were escaping the Inquisition that had made its way to uh, receive Brazil. They got on a ship and they went to what was known as New Amsterdam. And there they faced also Peter Stuyvesant, who was an ardent anti-Semite as well. He didn't like Jews. He didn't want Jews in his colony. But they messaged back to some of their buddies in the French West, French West, the West, West Indies Company. And some people told Stuyvesant, you got to let the Jews in. So he let them in, but he took all their furniture. But, you know, what can you do? <laughs> so the first Jews settled in, in, in the New World in 1654 in New York. They were escaping Jewish persecution. And it's sort of ironic because New York is one of the largest Jewish populations in the country now. But the first 23 Jews officially, officially there were Jews who were in America before that. But that's when the first Jews came to America. Yeah. 
But dude, that's why also in, in my in our tradition, we have we have Spanish Jews, French Jews, Italian Jews, Polish Jews, Russian Jews, Jews from Iceland, Jews from Japan, Jews from China, because we were expelled and we lived in a lot of places. So we pick up the food and the culture of, you know, that's why Jews like Chinese food. Because we lived in China. Yes. Um, there's this interesting movie called Marvel Soft Content. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Never saw it. It's, Marvel it's, Soft Content. It's German. It's made by. Okay. Um, not German, but it's, it's a German language. It's a short film. Um, I think it's available on video, like where I watched it. Okay. Um, and it follows this boy who is Jewish, but he, but he grew up in Germany and sort of trying to deal with his identity. And it starts off with um, a German boy insulting him in the bathroom and he punches him mm. and breaks his nose. And then things move on from there. there. But there's this interesting moment. The first time I heard the word show up was in that film. Mm -hmm. And he runs into a former teacher who says, oh, I hope you're okay. I heard about you punched that kid. Oh no, you know, I'm teaching about the show a lot, et cetera, et cetera. And what you explained was what that word means. It sounds like she was trying to, or the way that, you know, that they included it in some way to try and use it like, oh, yeah. I, I feal with you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does fall a little bit. By the way, if you ever have nine hours where you have absolutely nothing else to do, <laughs> the fa it, it really became, Really, the word became concretized with the movie Show Up, famous 1985 film that's nine hours long, which is considered one of the best documentaries about the Holocaust. Would you consider oh, one yeah. of the best? I mean, it's, it's nine hours long, so it's it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot for one person. It's, it was shown in a in a several part series on television, but that's that that made the word really, besides use, being used in Israel and in Jewish circles, it became sort of concretized as a cultural. Uh, symbol to you show up in that way as well. Yes. So somebody from online asked, with the advent of life in real time that is available to the internet, are the current levels of anti-Semitism more or less concerning than in the 1930s without instant access to worldwide events? Well, I think that to me, uh, and I have to say I'm an idealist, and I never thought, I never thought in my lifetime that I would see the current rise in anti-Semitism that we have now. But it's deeply concerning. There are, I think we have to be careful when we make comparisons between the Holocaust and other events, just like we have to be careful when we make comparisons between any historical event. But in terms of anti-Semitism itself, it's on the rise. But so is so are other forms of hatred and prejudice on the rise as well. But it's deeply concerning that. Um, and my feeling is that uh, well, I once had, I had a history professor, American Jewish history, um, uh, Jonathan Sarna, and he's at Brandeis now, but he used to say anti-Semitism and all hatred and prejudice is like a library book. It only takes the proper moment for the person to check out the book. It never goes away. It's always there. These things always have been. Anti-Semitism will always be there. It depends on how much we let those people come out of their hiding places in society. And I think because of recent political events and other events, that the people that have this kind of hatred have felt emboldened and they have been affirmed in some circles of our society to come forward. And there's issues of free speech and other things. So I think those people have been there, but when they come out, the, the, the dangerous part is when they come out, then they're able to recruit others to their same ideology and to me, and I'm not an anti-technology person, but the internet in that way has been one of the worst things that happened in our society. It's one of the best things, but it's one of the worst things because it's allowed people who could not be connected before. And it, they could recruit people who were at a low point in their life or disappointed or whatever the reason that the internet has allowed this recruitment and this expansion. Surely when you read ADL studies, Anti-Defamation League, and, uh, and um, in the Muslim community and other communities, LBGQ community, all the studies say that all of this is on the rise and it's very concerning. And it's concerning because the idea of also us standing on the sidelines and what we can do and what the government can do. And, you know, there's, there is a limit to freedoms. You know, we, we, are, we are not completely free. We do limit, you can't say whatever you want with free speech, there are limitations of it. So it's a big question for our society. How do we balance the freedoms that we have, the society that we want to have with the people who are the haters, who are now allowed, and in fact, in some circles, embraced? 
you know. I don't, my, the computer went off here, so I don't see any questions online. So if there are any others, please, or if you have any questions in the room, I'm happy to answer them. Anything else? So there are other ones here. Where please go ahead. Try to answer said, quickly. Do we have time? I don't know if Steve went. We'll, we'll wait. Like, we'll okay, good. What are the most common microaggressions people currently make against Jews, and what should teachers look out for? I think there are things that kids say, like um, comments, those comments like, don't Jew me down, Jews control the media, Jews are all, you know, Jews have a lot of money, Jews are all rich, Jews are all whatever. I think those kind of, and I think they hear it in society, they hear it online, maybe they hear it from family members. I think that's how things start. I think that those are the microaggressions, and I, and I have all the time kids saying, Rabbi, my teacher said this, or another student said this, or someone in, you know on the bus said this. Those are, I think, those are very common, and they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be ignored because those are the seeds that are planted for the more serious things that happen. And we're supposed to live in a society that's compassionate and kind, right? We forget about that. We have a certain responsibility of the way we speak to each other. And I think those are some of the things that I hear that a lot from kids. Every week I hear kids that call me and say, Rabbi, I heard whatever. Those kind of comments about Jewish people. And they, you know what? Some of those same people say it about black people. They say it about women. They say it about gay people. They say, so sometimes it's all, you know, it's all kind of lumped together. So another one is, what is your response to the idea that European Jews are not real Jews and they have usurped true Jewish or Israelite history? European Jews are not true Jews. I'm not, I'm not really sure where that comes from. We have, you know, within our own, like, I don't know whatever religion or whatever group you belong to, there's always disagreements, even in a family, right? So we have disagreements in our family, which, you know, our Western European Jews are, there's, we have different Jews, Sephardic, which are sort of a Spanish descent, and Ashkenazic, which are Eastern European descent, and they're, they're sort of arguing, like, whose customs are better and all that. But I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure what that question implies. I mean, there's disagreements amongst us in our own Jewish community, but we're a small number of people. You know, for instance, two third, uh, you know, there are 9.5 million Jews that were European before the World War II, and there are only 3 million left after. So we're a very small, we've lost a lot of people in, in that small period of time. So. I don't really completely understand the question, sorry. And the only other one on here is, why is it that we don't learn from history after all that has happened? Uh, why, why is it that anti-Semitism is largely ignored in modern times? Do well, you feel it's ignored? No, I, I don't think it's ignored. I think that, like, listen, you know, that, this isn't a political, I'm a religious leader, I'm a political leader. The thing about guns, in my tradition and in yours or whatever, if you don't have a tradition, your value system says that life is primary, right? You do everything to save life and health. Most people believe that. And yet we can't get anything done about mass murdering of our children, it seems. So you ask a question, well, why can't we seem to do anything about anti-Semitism? We can't seem to do things about a lot of things. We have some cultural problems that go across all kinds of issues that we face in our society, not only anti-Semitism, sexism, racism, gun violence, a violent culture. I mean, we have a lot of things that we can't get done. I think that, I think the idea that has to change is that good people have to speak out and people can't, as a religious leader, I'm just speaking from my own perspective. I find religious leaders that are in the media and are in public are loud screaming fanatic people. That's who people cover. They don't cover the 90% of religious leaders that are like me that believe in interfaith dialogue and, and creating a world that's better and, and not just tolerance, but acceptance of other people. So we as society have to sort of reject the loud screamers and we can't give them credibility, just like we can't give too much, uh, too much press or information about anti-Semitism. We need to use some of our energy to combat it and do things about it, whatever prejudice or hatred there is that we find in the world. It's very frustrating. But why does history repeat itself? It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> why does history, we can't, we have to learn from everything that we live now, even your own family. 
Your personality, who you are, is all based on the past. Whether you like it or not, you've, you've inherited the psychology, the good and bad from your family. So have I. And so we have to deal, understand what it is before we can deal with it. So we can't, that's why history is so critical for you to teach kids how to think. And they can change history, but they have to know what it is and know why we do things and know why we act a certain way. That's all based in the past. We need to understand, we can only change the future if we understand truth, the factual past. There's different interpretations, yes, but we need to understand you can't get anywhere if you don't do that. So that the answer to that line. So I, I know it's a big subject. And when Steve told me, you're going to talk about anti-Semitism. Oh, that's a big thing. It's, so I speak about it from a historical perspective. I hope you, in our tradition, we have a saying uh, translated from Hebrew. It's basically, if you learned one thing from our time together, then the time would be valuable. So I hope you learned at least one thing today. And I, I, again, I respect you, admire you for coming here and learning and, and growing. And I see a future that's good because you as teachers are gonna allow kids to think clearly and rationally and, and be able to process things. And that's really what education is about. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, everyone is online and everyone's here. It is that, about that time for break. Couple of things. There is a leaderboard contest going on. I have additional books we'll be, uh, we'll be handing out. So if you look at the leaderboard on your Whova app for engagement, you can actually get a couple of additional books if you win that is for engagement online. Uh, unfortunately, it's not for, it's not, unless you win and you're here, I'll hand you the book. So you're more than welcome to participate. And also for posting photographs, the photographs I'd love to see of you in your classroom, if you have any. That'd be fantastic. If you have some of you in your family, that's fantastic as well. But it'd be nice to see like what type of activities you do in your classroom. Uh, so that's available as well. Uh, lunchtime, please be back uh, on time because I know we went a little bit over, but at the same time, it's uh, uh, Gidon Lev is going to be presenting. He's actually, again, the Holocaust survivor. He, li he lives in Israel, but he's in California today. When he comes back on, he's going to be talking about his experiences being one. He is one of the few children survivors of President's staff. Uh, and, uh, and also currently he confronts anti-Semitism online on TikTok. Yes, I, uh, I, and I found him because I do what every 50 year old man does. I sit around and scroll through TikTok <laughs> all the time, but he has 3 million followers. He has 3 million followers on TikTok and he's actually made a huge impact for on, Holocaust, on uh, educating people about the Holocaust and confronting racism, prejudice, and anti-Semitism online. So please, he will be joining us probably for, uh, exactly at, noon, at uh, one o'clock. So uh, do your best. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you back in just a few minutes or 45 minutes. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you coming out.